And as Stephen said, welcome to this webinar. What we're going to do in this session is to talk about the idea of microservices. We're going to talk about the architecture that we use when we're developing applications using microservices, and specifically what we can do when we're using Java to deliver some or all of those services. And we're going to look at some of the challenges that we have in terms of how to architect the application and also more in terms of how we can address some of the requirements from a, a performance perspective and look at what we at Azul do with the Zing JVM and how that fits into the whole picture. The first thing we want to do is, is look at the, the changing face of software development because we've seen over the last few years that we've moved away from the traditional way of developing software where we've had sort of monolithic applications to the idea of using microservices. And realistically, this is not something that is um, particularly new. So many of the ideas behind microservices are not something that have suddenly come up in the last few years. And what I did was I did some research and looked at the history of this. And realistically, if you go right back, you can find that the idea of remote procedure calls actually dates back to the late 1960s. The, the idea of the term RPC or remote procedure call actually dates to about 1981. But the idea that we could take a, an application that was running on one machine and then make a call to another machine across a network and request something to happen. So we send a message across the network, request the service to execute, that returns a result and use it in our application. That's been around for a very long time. And we've gone through a number of sort of iterations of this, but the, the overriding sort of idea behind this is essentially distributed computing. We want to be able to break up our application and have different parts of the functionality execute in different places. Now, that's always been a sort of goal, but what we've seen more recently is with the rise in cloud computing as our way of deploying applications, this approach of distributing our application has become much more sort of important, much more relevant. And the reason being that obviously we don't necessarily know where within a data center or where within the cloud each of those pieces of the application are going to execute. So we need a way of, of breaking it up and distributing it amongst the different parts of the cloud. As I say, we've, we've taken a number of uh, different approaches to this. And so I looked at the different sort of ideas and you can kind of go back to sort of 1991 where there was the introduction of CORBA, the Common Object Request Broker Architecture. That was one approach where it was, it was quite a complicated approach in terms of breaking things up and having messages sent back and forth developed by the object management group. Then we had another approach, which was in 1993. That was the distributed computing environment, DCE. Um, Open Software Foundation came up with that. A few years later, we got Microsoft involved. So we had DCOM, which was all around sort of Windows platform. And that sort of led to the development of a slightly different approach, which was XML RPC. Still doing remote procedure calls, but using XML as a way of encoding the messages that we wanted to send to say, this is what we want to execute. And then the result that came back was also encoded in XML. Taking that one step further, we saw the evolution of web services. Um, this was around the beginning of the, the 21st century, about 2003, and the introduction of the Simple Object Access Protocol, or SOAP. So that was really the sort of beginning of web services as we know them now. And obviously what we've seen again as an evolution of that is moving away from the idea of SOAP and WSDL, and those types of things, to using RESTful web services. And that's really where we're at at the moment, where we, if we want to use a web service, we're using a RESTful approach and that all seems to work quite well. So what has caused a rise in the popularity of microservices? Well, obviously, as I said, the whole concept of deploying things into the cloud, where as users, we're not worried about who is providing the data center. It's not like we build a data center, we install machines, and then we actually deploy our applications onto those machines. It's taking that and abstracting it away to say, we have a cloud provider. I want an instance of an operating system. I want this number of cores to be able to execute it. I need this much memory. And then I want to 
run my application on that instance, but I don't care about how that actually gets provisioned. I don't care what data center it's in, who installs it, who makes it happen. It's just available when I need it. But beyond that, there are some other things which have helped to drive the adoption of microservices in terms of application development. The first of those is a different approach to how we actually develop our software. In the past, and you know, I've been in the software development business for over 30 years, and I can remember the sort of old waterfall style of approach, where what we would do is we would we would go and we would talk to our users and we collect all of our requirements, a single process of collecting everything that we needed to know. Then we go through the whole analysis phase, then we go through the whole um, object model phase, then we go through the whole coding phase, testing phase, and then deliver it. And that could be many months, even years, between when we started collecting the requirements and when we actually delivered something to our users. Problem is that by the time you actually deliver those things to the users, most likely the requirements are actually changed because the business has moved on. Agile methodology, as I'm sure many people know, is a different approach. Now it's a much more iterative way of doing our development. We collect some requirements, we start doing analysis and building services, and we do it very quickly. And then we go back and we iterate over that because things may change, things may move on. So we can now collect more requirements. We can then develop new services and deploy those very quickly as well. So agile, agile response to changes in terms of the requirements. But there's also other things that have helped drive microservices and, and DevOps is a big part of that. In the past, we've had a clear distinction between the development team and the operations team. Development team are all responsible for creating the application and making it work. Then they hand it over to the operations team who actually handle the day-to-day -day running of the application and make it available to the users. DevOps eliminates that distinction. So now we have the idea that developers can do some of the operations side of things as well. And so they say, okay, I've developed this code. Now I want to be able to deploy it into the cloud, hit a button, off it goes. And that's where other frameworks and tools have come in to make that much more easy in terms of delivering that functionality. We have things like Chef, we have things like Puppet, which allow us to script the way that we want to deploy services into our cloud. We've got things like Hudson, we've got things like Jenkins, which are about continuous integration. When a developer is working on a particular source code file, they make the changes to it, they push that back into the uh, repository and it's automatically picked up and integration happens so that the application can be compiled or the tests can be run and we can very quickly know that yes that change works and it passes all the tests then we use continuous deployment so we simply say okay now let's hit the button and say right let's make that particular new piece of functionality available to our users through using the scripts that we've set up through chef and puppet so the, the idea behind microservices if you look at the sort of basic approach is moving from the idea of monolithic application to using microservices that breaks up that application into individual components. And if you look at some of the, the biggest internet companies that we know, things like Amazon, Netflix, and Twitter, all of them show very clearly that a monolithic application just doesn't scale to very large numbers of users. If you want a big application and you try and add more and more users, it just doesn't work. So one of the real benefits of microservices is the fact that we can take an application, we can break it up into these individual services, link them together, and then scale the bits that we need to scale in a horizontal way to provide us with vertical scaling. We'll, we'll kind of come back to that and talk about a little bit more about that in a moment. So if we look at the sort of basic architectural ideas of microservices, what we're dealing with here is our end users. Now our end users, have requirements in terms of what they want to be able to do with the service. And let's, let's take a, a simple example of a banking application. So our users are going to go onto the banking application, they want to perform transactions, transferring money from one account to another or, or whatever. So all they want to do is to be able to use that web-based front end and interact with our service. So they're going to interact with something in the cloud. And what we can see is that from their point of view, all they're interested in is performing that particular transaction. How it happens in the 
overall perspective doesn't matter to them they simply say i want to transfer money from this account to that account pay this bill whatever what we do as developers is we then break that down into our microservices and we configure it so that each individual microservice works with the other services that it requires and as the diagram shows here we may have another cloud where we've got databases that provide a persistence layer for us for the various information like the account details and so on so that allows us the flexibility to break up a monolithic application into these individual components. But what we're really seeing here is, is not really much of a change. All we're seeing here is effectively a modular monolithic application. We've taken the mon monolithic application, we've broken up into different modules. The advantage of that is that it allows us to then have different teams work on different parts of the application. Those teams can have domain expertise. Let's take an example from our banking application. We're going to have um, part of the system which is an authorization service, which says, okay, does that user have the permission to do whatever it is they're trying to do? And that's something that one team may have <clears throat> a lot of domain expertise on. They can choose to develop that in isolation because they know how to develop the authorization part of the system. And they can say, right, we're going to use Java, we're going to use Spring, we're going to use these libraries, and we're going to do it in this way. And that's all good. So they, they can do that and they can work to develop the best implementation of that service that they know how to do. Other services can be developed by different teams. So they may have different domain expertise. We may be dealing with some credit check service. And so we'll have a different team that works on that. They may choose a different set of functionality. So they may say, okay, we're gonna use Java, but rather than using Spring, we'll use Java EE or Jakarta as it is now. And we'll use different parts of the library functionality. We use Micronaut or something like that. And they can do that again, without having to worry about what the authorization team are doing for their service. All of these are very separate. They're very uh, isolated so that we can, with a, a clear interface between them, so we know what messages we need to send, we know what results we're gonna get back, then we can make it all work together. But we don't have to worry about having complex interactions between these different teams to make sure that everything works together. It's just based on a clear separation of responsibilities. Now, what we might see is that one particular part of our system starts to become a bottleneck. And this is where the idea of the microservices architecture really shows the value that it can provide. Again, using our example, let's say we have the, the authorization part of our system. Now, everything relies on that. So every part of the system needs to determine whether the user is authorized to do something. So that becomes a bit of a bottleneck. And so if we had our monolithic application, that would be a real problem because we'd have to try and determine how to make that more efficient within the application. Using microservices, we have the ability to scale horizontally. Now what we can do is we can say, well, okay, rather than having one instance of the authorizing service, let's spin up multiple instances of those authorization services. Because users are distinct from one another, there's very little chance of interaction between them. So authorization can be nicely divided up into individual services. And we could have like, let's say a group of 10 users handled by one instance of that service, another group of 10 users provided by a service by another instance of that service and so on. So long as we have our persistence layer separated out from that, then it becomes very easy to scale horizontally. And we can do that effectively infinitely. We can we can spin up as many instances as we need. And that part of the system then no longer presents a bottleneck in terms of the performance. What we do have to consider though, is how the performance of an application works when we do involve multiple microservices. In the case of our monolithic application, the latency, the time it takes to respond to a request is going to be dictated by that application. So what happens within the application dictates the, the latency. If we break things up into microservices, and especially if we're using Java, what we'll see is that the latency is going to be dependent on all of those services. And it's gonna be an aggregate of the latency of each of those services. If one service has a latency of let's say 20 milliseconds, then another one has a latency of 10 milliseconds, and another one has a latency of 50 milliseconds, 
we've got a latency of 80 milliseconds associated with that. What we need to do then is to figure out how can we reduce that latency for each of those services in order to reduce the overall latency provided to the user. Because remember, the user doesn't care how many services are being involved. It's all about, I just want to do the transaction that I want to do, and I want it to happen very quickly. So now I'd like to ask you, the audience, a question. So we're gonna run a little poll here. And if we bring up the, the poll for you to answer, hopefully, yes, there we go. We'll see that in a moment. Um, the question is, you, the audience, how many classes do you think a Java microservice should have? And the four answers I've given you as possibilities are, one is less than 10, second one is less than 100, third one is less than 1,000, and the fourth one is, well, the number is actually irrelevant. I don't, you know, it doesn't make any difference to a microservice. It's, it's what the service does. So if I give you just a couple more seconds to answer the question, and then if we close the poll and look at the results, see what we see. Ah, yes. Now, this is very interesting because this is the third time today that I've done this webinar. And what I've seen is, uh, a slight difference in terms of the results of this. What we're seeing here is a very large number of people who say that the number is irrelevant. Then we've got quite a small number of people who say less than a thousand, even less that say less than a hundred, and about a fifth of the audience say less than 10. Um, that sort of ties in with the results I had in the earlier versions of the webinar, although uh, the results were slightly less um, distinct than this one. Certainly the, the number of people who said the number is irrelevant uh, in previous cases was less than 50%. But it does show that a lot of people think the number of classes is not something you should judge a microservice by. So let's continue then. Now, if we look at the core concepts of microservices, one of the things that I think is, is probably um, not so good about microservices is the naming. I mean, we call it a microservice. And micro comes from the Greek meaning small. And so it's the idea of like people immediately think, oh, a microservice should be a small service. But that's not really what we mean here. Um, what we should be thinking about is doing one thing and doing it well. So the micro should not be the size of the service itself. It should be the, the micro respect or um, in in thinking about what the service actually does. So its functionality should be small versus the size of the actual service in terms of number of classes or number of lines of code. So doing one thing and doing it well doesn't mean that it actually has to be a small amount of code. And what I've said here is that Cassandra is a good example. Cassandra is a NoSQL database. There's you know, thousands of classes in Cassandra. So we could call that a microservice because it does one thing and it does it well. It persists data in a NoSQL way. And we can think of that as a single service. The challenge that we have when we're starting to architect an application using microservices is trying to find that right balance. How many services is the right number? And looking at what the functionality is, what each service does, and figuring out, okay, if we make our services too small and we restrict what they're doing really um, uh, in a big way, then we might end up with too much complexity in terms of the way all the services have to work together. So orchestrating all of those services and managing them becomes very, very difficult. If we make go the other way or make the services too big, then we end up where we, we start to lose the advantages of the, the architecture that we have. So where we can get this horizontal scalability, then we lose the advantage of being able to spin up new instances when we need them, but also <clears throat> the ability to then uh, shut those services down when we don't need them. One of the other things as I already said is that we need to have very well-defined interfaces. So again, typically we're gonna use RESTful web services for this, but we need to know exactly what messages need to be sent to a service and what results will be passed back in what format so that we can then interact with that service. That, that makes it easy for us to then have the idea of a loosely coupled, highly cohesive architecture. Now, this was interesting because um, this was kind of an extreme microservice example. And I came across this the other day when I was putting together the slides for this 
webinar and I found an example which was Monzo and Monzo is a, an online bank it's been around for a while there was an interesting article in Wired um, just recently about this and uh, Jack Kleeman who was one of the architects of this system initially he posted a thing where he showed this picture and the picture is the graph of all the microservices and there were 1500 microservices that they had and that seems like quite a lot um, for a banking application. They had 1,500 microservices, 150 developers, all of it was written in Go, which I also thought was quite interesting that they didn't um, use a polyglot approach. Their services ranged from 500 lines of code to 10,000 lines of code, which again, from my perspective, if I was architecting this, the 500 lines of code, if you've got that many microservices, seem to be on a little bit on the small side. Um, and then they used a single Cassandra instance, or a, at least a cluster of um, nodes for a Cassandra instance as their persistence layer. And it's well worth looking because there's a couple of blogs that have been written by the developers at Monzo. And if you look on Twitter, there's a very interesting um, discussion between Jack and various other people who've kind of questioned him about this approach as to justifications for using that number of microservices and the way that it works and so on. So this is a very good sort of case study if you're looking at the design of, of microservice architectures. One of the things that's interesting looking at this diagram is that you can see that there's sort of um, four or five kind of um, centers where lots of services access those individual services and those ones are the ones you would expect they're the things like authentication authorization configuration and so on um, but it is a very interesting case study if you're looking for ideas about how to architect a microservice architecture okay let's talk a little bit about deployment because it's all well and good saying okay we're going to break up our 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 application into all these different services but how do we go about actually taking those services putting them in the cloud and making them work and making them available and what we what we've seen in terms of the development of that is a much greater use of the idea of containers what i'm going to talk about here is docker because that's obviously the the one that most people seem to be using now and what we're trying to do here is is the idea of um having a different approach to virtual machines virtual machines have been around for a long time and essentially what you're doing with a virtual machine is, is replicating the entire operating system with all the facilities and so on, on top of a host OS. But that's a very heavy weight approach because you have to replicate all of the operating system for each service that you're going to provide because each one's gonna have its own virtual machine. So the idea behind Docker is it takes advantage of some of the underlying host operating system features, specifically the fact that um, initially, it was developed on top of Linux. Yes, you can now run it on top of Mac, you can run it on top of Windows. But initially, it was developed on top of Linux, and Linux had some features built in which made it very uh, easy to develop a container engine, specifically the idea of C groups. C groups allow you to both restrict in terms of the number of resources that are available to a runtime that's on running on top of the container engine you can limit the number of cores you can limit the number of um, and the amount of memory that's used you can even restrict in terms of networking access and so on things like that then you've got the idea of um, a multi-layer file system a union file system and we'll kind of come back to this in a moment but it's the idea of using those lightweight operating system support to provide isolated containers and this is really the key thing because what we want to be able to do is we want to say okay i want to deploy a service a and that service is going to depend on a certain set of underlying things certain libraries that we want to use certain runtimes that we want to use and one of the biggest problems that we have when we're creating enterprise applications and trying to break it up into different services in the past has been well okay i need version 3.2 of library x and then another service needs version 4.1 of library x and so you've got to install both of those on your system you've got to make sure that they're separated and then you've got to make sure that the individual services are talking to the, or using the right version of that library and that all gets very complicated similarly with you know java as the runtime you know some services might use jdk 8 some services might use jdk 11 some users uh, services might use jdk 14 
But we then need to configure all of that on our operating system. By using containers, we put all of that into the container and we isolate it so that we know that service A has version 3.2 of the library, it has JDK 8. Service B has version 4.1 of the library, it has JDK 11 and so on. When it comes to, to building the containers and using them, obviously we've got our Docker container engine as the, the way that we run things. What we then do is we build on top of that and we use layers to do that. Typically what we do is we start with our operating system. And so in the case of this example, we're gonna use Ubuntu as our operating system. So we'll, let's say you select 18.04 version of Ubuntu, we want to use that. That way we know exactly we've, what we've got in terms of that version of the operating system. It's different to 16.04, it's different to 20.04. We know we've got exactly what 18.04 provides and that's what we're going to use in our container. We then build a layer on top of that, which is the Java runtime that we want to use. So now we're going to say, okay, JDK 8, JDK 11, JDK 14. We want to run some servlets. We want to use RESTful Web Services. So we're going to use Tomcat. But which version of Tomcat are we going to use? In this case, let's say version 7, because that seems to work very well. So we'll run Tomcat on top of our JDK 8 on top of Ubuntu 18.04. All the things that we know exactly what we've got, we can test with that, make sure our application runs in exactly the way that we want it to. And then obviously we put our application code in, we put our servlets on there and build that fourth layer. The key thing about this is that in order to build an image, we make all of those layers read only. And this is very important because if we want to deploy multiple instances of a container, what we want to do is share all of those pieces between the different containers. We don't want to have to replicate all of those pieces so that we, we spend a lot of resources in replicating those things. So if we can just share all of those different pieces as read only, so nothing changes, then we can have one instance of that image shared about as, as many instances of that image as we want to use. Clearly, the difficulty with that is that we may want to actually change some things in the file system based on what the individual instance is going to do. Very reasonable thing to want to do. And to allow that to happen, we then add a writable layer. The writable layer works using this idea of a, a union file system or a multi-layer file system, part of the core Linux environment. What that says is that, let's say we want to change the Tomcat configuration file. So we go to slash etc slash default slash Tomcat 8, and we want to change some parameters about that Tomcat instance. Rather than changing the file in the image, which is the one that we want to share amongst everybody else, we say, okay, in our writable layer, we will copy that file and then we'll allow the changes to be made within the copy at the writable level. From an application point of view, when it looks at the file system and it reads that file, it's going to read the one that we've made available and ch made changes to rather than the one that's in that read only layer in the image. What that does is massively restrict the amount of data that we need to replicate into each instance that we create of this container. So it, it's a, a really smart way of doing things because now what we end up with is a container which has our image, which is shared amongst however many containers we want. And then all we need is the writable layer, which is only the things that change and therefore the amount of things that we need to, to actually provide instances of is really quite small. It's only the files that actually change. When we come to deploy that into the cloud, we can do that in a couple of different ways. So the first of those is we can say, okay, let's use infrastructure as a service. We provide an operating system as the host, and then we deploy our Docker container engine on top of that. We put our container with our image on top of that, and everything works. If we wanted to, we can go one step further, and we can find a cloud provider who has platform as a service available. And in this case, we have a Docker engine as the, the platform. And so all we do is we say, here's my container, here's my image with all the things I want to run, put that on it and make it happen. So challenges of microservices. 
microservices, as we've seen, are ideally suited to cloud computing because you can deploy them across multiple cloud instances. Everything's contained in this nice container. It's all packaged so we don't have to worry about different versions of libraries or runtimes or anything like that, which is all really good. But then we've got to take it to the next level. What we've got to do is figure out how do we manage those microservices? Because just having a microservice is, is one part of the, the puzzle, but it doesn't solve the whole thing. What we need to do is say, okay, if we want to process transaction, then we need to call this service, which then calls another service, calls another service and so on. And that's orchestration. How do we orchestrate the services to work together? Then we've also got the whole thing about lifecycle management. When we want to start up our service, we need to start the individual services. So we need to start them, we need to stop them. How do we deal with restarts? So if we had a situation where something failed, how do we restart it? And then this whole idea of horizontal scalability for our individual services. So that if we see an increase in load, then we spin up new instances of that service to address that load and, and keep the latency um, at a reasonable level. And then if the load drops, then we want to shut down those services because what we don't want to do is over provision the services. If we're deploying into a public cloud, we pay for the, the individual resources that we use. What we really want to do is optimize that so that we only spin up services when we need them. And when we don't need them, we shut them down. That way we're only paying for the things that we actually need to use rather than keeping things going when we're not actually using them. The most popular answer of how to do that next level on top of the containers and the, the Docker side of things is Kubernetes. So I'm sure lots of people are familiar with this. I won't spend a lot of time talking about this, but essentially what this gives us is a set of primitives for saying, okay, we want to deploy an application. We want to manage the application and then we also want to scale the individual parts of the application through the microservices using Kubernetes. And there's realistically sort of three things that you can think of in terms of that, that functionality. First of those is pods. And pods is a higher level abstraction, taking a number of services that are closely linked and putting them together. So you create a basic scheduling unit of these individual services. They can still be developed by different teams. They can still be replaced independently but we're putting them together to give us that high level of abstraction we have them effectively co-located on the same host so they can share resources in terms of um, the underlying um, memory the underlying processing power and so on and they also share an ip address they may have different port numbers to access the different parts of the service but they would share an ip address that's a pod controller manages a set of pods so it's, again, taking that to the next layer of abstraction, saying, OK, individual pods that give us different sort of high level services, then we link them together with the controller. And by doing that, we can create services which then have a set of pods that work together and give us the, in effect, the overall application functionality where our banking application needs to process a transaction and it all happens using Kubernetes. Let's talk a little bit about Java and microservices and some of the things that we need to know about there. Well, firstly, containers are a really good idea when it comes to using Java for microservices. And the reason because behind that is that we can have isolation, as we've already explored, but we can, exp we can have isolation from the point of view of the JVMs. Two things there are very important. One is that we may have different JDKs, different uh, versions of Java that we want to use for these different services. One may be using eight, one may be using 11, one may be using 14. Rather than having to deploy all those JDKs onto our host operating system and then making sure that each of the services points at the right place for its Java home and finds the right path to the executable, we put it into the container. And then we know exactly which version of Java we're running, even to the update level. The other thing that we can do which is really advantageous for this, is that from JDK 9, because of the introduction of modularity in the um, jig project Jigsaw, what we can now do is we can use a tool called JLink to create a, a runtime which is specific to our service, specific to our application. If you look at 
JDK 11, there's about 350 megabytes of JDK if you download the full thing. If you use JLink and you say, okay, my application does something, a service provides something, does something, and it uses, let's say, SQL, uses XML for whatever it's doing. If we use JLink, we can only select the modules from the JDK that we need for that service. So we'll select the SQL module, we'll select the base module, XML module, logging module, whatever, and the modules or the code that we need for our actual service. We can then build that runtime, which can move from like 350 megabytes, even with something like SQL and XML and so on, you can shrink that down to maybe 35, 40 megabytes of runtime, especially if you strip the symbol table, remove the manual pages and so on. So that's an order of magnitude smaller than you would have with a JDK. So now you've got this like 35 megabytes of JDK, put that into your container. That's all you need to run the particular service within that container. Most um, people who deploy into containers for Java, Java services tend to use a single jar because it tends to be fairly small. Don't have to do that. It's not a requirement. So you can use multiple jars if you want to. And the other thing that's nice with using um, a container architecture is that you can have a consistent deployment model with non-Java services. Let's say you've got some services created in Go, you've got some services in C++, but from a deployment perspective, how you push them out into the cloud it's exactly the same process, regardless of how the application or the service is being developed. Some of the things in terms of being aware of, of how JVMs work with containers. In the past, we have had some issues about the JVM not being C group aware. That problem has now been solved. So, so long as you're using JDK 10 or later, or JDK 8 update 191 or later, which I hope you all are, then the, C, the uh, JVM will understand about C groups. In the past, if you started a JVM within a container and you didn't necessarily set the heap size, the JVM would look at the host operating system and, and look at the memory available to the entire host operating system, not what was configured for that particular C group and the container that it was running in. And that could lead to some problems because sometimes you would run out of memory and you couldn't allocate more memory because the C group was restricting it, but the JVM thought you had that much memory. One of the other things to remember is when you're configuring your container and thinking about how much memory to allocate to it, don't just take into account the heap size because yes, you may have, let's say a two gigabyte heap for your microservice, but you don't make the restriction on the C group to gigabytes. The Java virtual machine needs some memory, needs it for running the Java runtime itself. Um, you're going to do some JIP compilation. So the bytecodes and the compile code needs to go somewhere. If you're using things like NIO and mapped byte buffers, then those need to go somewhere plus threads plus the stack all takes up memory. So that's something to bear in mind when you're setting the size of your um, C group. Challenges for microservices when you're running on top of a JVM. A lot of it is around responsiveness. So the idea of latency associated with your application. And um, what you want to make sure is that, that depending on how heavy the load is, you don't want the um, degradation to suddenly fall off a cliff. What you want to do is you want to say, okay, as the load increases, you want the degradation in response time to be sort of linear with that increase in load. And then ideally what you're going to do is, is start up new instances. But the problem that you face is that you can have a service level agreement for your end user saying that this transaction will be completed within, let's say, 100 milliseconds. But the problem you have as an architect and a developer is that there are a number of microservices involved in that, a number of different teams. So each of those is going to have its own SLA. And how do you divide that up? So you've got 100 milliseconds for your user. You've got three different, or let's say five different microservices. One of them, are they all going to have 20 milliseconds as their SLA? Or is it going to be one's got 50 milliseconds, the other's got 10, the other's got 20, and so on. So you, you need to kind of figure that out quite uh, carefully. The other thing in terms of JVMs is how quickly can you spin up a new instance of a service and how it accessible if the load increases, because that's one of the benefits of microservices, the ability to respond and scale horizontally. 
let's talk a little bit about Zing and what we can do with that to solve some of these problems. So the idea behind Zing was to look at how Java worked and figure we could improve on that. But what we didn't want to do is actually start from scratch and say, okay, let's completely rewrite the JVM. That would be far too much work. And most of the JVM works very well anyway. But there were certain bits of it that we thought, mm, you know what, we can do better. So we took the OpenJDK as our starting point and then we replaced certain bits. But the important thing for us and for you as users is that having made those changes and created a new binary JVM, we then run all of the TCK or JCK tests on that. And that's about 150,000 tests, which are used to verify that what we create in terms of JVM conforms to the Java SE specification. What that means is it gives you a very high level of confidence that your application from a functional point of view will run in exactly the same way on Zing as it will run on other JVMs that are past TCK. That means it's a very much a drop-in replacement for other JVMs. You don't have to modify your code. You don't have to recompile your code. You don't even have to change your startup scripts and change any of the command line flags. Any of the ones that we don't use, we simply ignore. So it won't stop the JVM from starting up. What we do in terms of changes is to remove all of the existing garbage collectors. And we just use one that's called C4. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. The second thing we've done more recently is to say, okay, JIT compilation. Again, we've got the C2 JIT compiler, the one that generates heavily optimized code. We'll replace that with something that we call Falcon. And then the last thing that we've done is to add some technology to the JDK that allows us to eliminate as far as possible the warm-up time that's associated with a Java application as it goes through the different phases of compilation, JIT compilation, uh, deoptimization, recompilation, and so on. C4. C4 is a pause-less collector, and the idea being to eliminate the impact of garbage collection on latency. What we do is we use a read barrier meaning that every time you access an object from your application code, we'll intercept that and check certain things based on the object header. That allows us to guarantee that when you get an object reference and we are doing a marking phase, your object will always be marked. So it can't be accidentally garbage collected. If we're in a relocation phase, then you will always get the right reference to that object because we're moving it around within the heap to compact the data. And you will always get the right reference to the object so that if you make changes to it, those changes won't be lost. So that allows us to have truly concurrent garbage collection. We do all our garbage collection at the same time application threads are running. We don't have stop the world pauses like we do in other garbage collectors. And we're able to compact the heap at the same time your application is running. What that does is effectively eliminate the problem of garbage collection latency. And because we have this aggregate idea, because we've got multiple services involved, by eliminating the garbage collection latency in each of those services, we eliminate the whole latency associated with garbage collection in our application. One of the other things we've done more recently is to reduce the minimum heap size for C4. So now down to 512 megabytes. Some people say that's still quite big for microservices, but there's a lot of microservices that are working in that kind of uh, heap space or bigger. As an example, here's uh, an example of a small service, small heap, small latency. So this is Hazelcast running on a two node system with a one gigabyte heap. And on the left, we've got hotspot. On the right, we've got Zing. What this is showing is latency, not of the application, but of the JVM. So we use a thing called jhiccup, puts a thread alongside the JVM and the application and simply spends most of its time asleep. And when it wakes up, it looks at the difference between when it woke up and when it expected to wake up. And by recording that difference, we can then see the effect of latency from the JVM and everything below it. If we look at the hotspot graph, what we're seeing here is a, is a pretty nasty graph actually, because they were seeing lots and lots of garbage collection activity. It's almost continuously doing garbage collection, 
probably that's uh, it may maybe there would be a better way of tuning things or providing more memory but in this particular case we're seeing almost consistent 25 to 40 millisecond pauses associated with minor gcs if we look at the zing side of things that's the same application running on the same machine same workload everything is identical but by using zing because we can do garbage collection concurrently we've effectively eliminated all that problem the, the kind of gc well not gc but the kind of latency we're seeing there is probably in the less than five milliseconds it's probably around two to three milliseconds maximum and a lot of that latency is not down to the jvm itself it'll be other things below it like the operating system doing context switching and various things like that falcon is a replacement for the c2 jit compiler and um, what we did we said okay can we produce better performing code in terms of what the JIT compiler generates. And to do that, again, we didn't start from scratch. We looked around and we said, there's this really good project called LLVM. It's open source, people like Intel, Nvidia, Sony, Microsoft, all contribute engineering to this. So let's use that as our starting point. That's been primarily designed as the, the second phase of a static compiler. So it's designed to generate code from intermediate representation, heavily optimized we integrated that with the jvm made it work as a jit made it work with the gc and so on and what it allows us to do is, is get better performing code so we can take advantage of certain things in terms of the chip architectures that the old c2 jit compiler can't do things like vector operations we can apply vector operations like avx2 avx512 to many more situations than c2 would as a good example, the Apache Arrow project, um, they were doing some performance um, work and they found that there was a bit of code that was very heavy in terms of IO. And so they rewrote it in C++ to try and optimize it. Then they compared that code with the handcrafted C++ with the results that they got with Zing running purely on the Java implementation. And they found that the results were almost identical so they actually got 50% faster without having to do handcrafted C++. And realistically, the reason they got that was because the C++ code that they had written, they were compiling with LLVM. When we used LLVM as our JIT compiler, it was in effect generating the same code. And so we got the same improvement in performance, but without having to write C++, a real um, advantage. Now, when it comes to starting up web services, a lot of people will say, oh, OK, let's use ahead of time compilation. Let's use static compilation, compile into native instructions, and that will start really quickly. And yes, it does. So you can get fast startup with AOT, good for microservices. But there's a cost associated with that. And the cost is that when you do ahead of time compilation, a lot of the optimizations that you would use in a JIT compiler you can't use in static compilation. Things like method inlining, you have to be much less aggressive in terms of how you do that. Method inlining is a very common way of, of improving the performance of code. And the reason you can't do that with static compilation is because the dynamic nature of Java in terms of class loading means that at runtime, you can load a new class and therefore the method that's being called at a certain point could be different based on the class that's loaded. If you use static compilation, you are not able to inline a method because you don't know whether at runtime somebody will load a new class and a different method. With JIT compilation, because you're looking at a running system, you know exactly which classes are loaded and therefore which methods are being called and you can inline them. Similarly, one of the big wins for JIT compilation is speculative optimizations. Basing your assumptions on what has happened in the previous execution of the application to predict what will happen in the future. Again, you can't do that with static compilation. JIT gives you better overall performance with code that's being compiled. So the drawback is the fact that you have this warm up time. So you have to go through the analysis, you have to go through the compilation and everything like that. One of the things that is worth considering though is, okay, even though you've got the warm-up time associated with that Java instance, the Java microservice, how long does it actually take you to provision a cloud instance? And what's the comparison in terms of that warm-up time to the time it takes you to provision the cloud? 
instance. To eliminate that further, what we've done is create this thing called Ready Now. And the idea is that what we do is we run your service or you run your service and you use a, a representative load to make the system do what it's supposed to do and you get it to the point where it's warmed up. So the code that needs to be compiled has been compiled and we've got a, a nicely running system. We then save a profile that includes four pieces of information. All the classes that are currently loaded, all the classes currently initialized, all the profiling data that was collected during the C1 phase of JIT compilation, and then all the de-optimizations. Because with speculative optimizations, the JIT compiler will make predictions about how the code will run, which sometimes aren't correct. So sometimes the JIT compiler has to throw away code that's compiled and recompile it based on new assumptions of how the code is actually being used. Being able to eliminate those or reduce those as far as possible will help a lot with improving the, the performance. So when you start up a new service, we use that profile to load as many classes as we can, initialize all the classes as we can, and then we compile the code that we need to run the application using the profiling data that we had before. Now what we do as well to make that even better is we use code stashing. We also record all the code that was compiled at the point where we save the profile. So then, because we know that the Falcon JIT compiler is fully deterministic, we know that with the same set of inputs in terms of the method code and the profiling data, we will get the same compiled code out of the LLVM compiler. We can simply eliminate the need to do the compilation by saying, okay, we have the same method, we have the same profiling data, let's use the cached version that we recorded last time and make the thing work even better. In terms of the ready now effect, again, from a latency perspective, you can see the orange line here. And what's happening is that we're going through various compilation, recompilation based on the optimizations and so on. With ready now, the blue line, we see a nice flat line where we're not seeing heavy latency involved and everything just works very nicely. One thing I would say about Zing in the cloud, um, in the past, we have provided a thing called the Zing system tools, and that was designed to improve the efficiency of how the memory system worked at a lower level than the JVM. So we actually installed things into the host operating system that would allow us to, to manage the mapping of physical pages to the virtual pages used by the JVM. For microservices where deploying into a container, that wasn't ideal because people didn't really want to interfere with the host operating system and have to, to do other things. So now we have a, a different way of doing that so that for Zing since August of last year, the Zing system tools are not installed by default. So you, you don't need to use them and you get the same advantages, but now you can put everything inside your container and it will all work in exactly the same way as any other JVM. If you are using heaps that are greater than one terabyte, then you do still need to use the Zing system tools. I guess what I would say is if you're using a Zing, if you're using a heap that's greater than one terabyte in your microservice, then maybe you need to think about if is it really a microservice. Um, you know, yeah, there are people who would use more than one terabyte, but that you know, it's something to consider. Installing Zing for the cloud identical to other JVMs now, so there's no special setup required outside the container and in terms of the ready now profiles, you can include those in your image for your container so that it can be shared. And again, you can start up new instances that way. Just to conclude then, basically microservices are very well suited to modern software development. This whole idea of an agile methodology using continuous integration, continuous deployment, and technologies like Docker to provide containers where we put everything into a nice sealed package, able to put that into the cloud, regardless of which cloud provider we're using, where it goes, doesn't matter. And the fact that we use Kubernetes to then manage the whole lifecycle management, the orchestration of those services and so on. Java microservices are a little bit different to normal applications, normal Java applications. So you need to think about the balance between the speed of startup, the maximum speed of the service and the latency associated with that. Getting that balance right can be quite important. And then to help you with that, obviously Zing is the ideal JVM for Java microservices. Superior heat management, the elimination of garbage collection latency, and the use of things like Falcon and ReadyNow technology for fast startup of the application. If you want to try 
Zing, you can do that free for 30 days. You can download it from our website here, run it on your system. If you need some help, we can we can provide that for you and you can generate some of those nice graphs where you can see the latency using hotspot or your current JVM. And then you can switch to Zing and you can see, wow, that's a real improvement. That's what we need. So that's the end of the webinar presentation. Let me now have a look and see whether we have some questions uh, that people have asked. Um, okay, so uh, what is the difference between Zing and Zulu? Ah, good question, yes. Well, Zulu is a build just of what is in the OpenJDK repository. So it's exactly the same as everybody else who builds OpenJDK. Zing takes OpenJDK as the starting point, but then switches out the garbage collectors, uses C4, switches out the C2 JIT compiler and uses Falcon and adds in the idea of ready now. So Zing is the high performance JVM with the rest of OpenJDK around it. Zulu is just pure OpenJDK. So we don't make any differences in terms of the way that the JVM performs. Um, is Zulu the exact of OpenJDK in all cases without all those bells and whistles that are included in Zing? Yes, that is essentially it. Um, it is exactly the same as um, Zulu is the exact same as OpenJDK. Zing is the one that has the performance improvements in it. Uh, another question, is there a version of Zing for JDK 14? Um, the answer to that is no. Um, what we've done with Zing, because of the engineering effort involved, we've decided to follow the same approach that Oracle have done in terms of long-term support. So rather than saying, okay, we will provide a new version of Zing every six months based on the changes to the OpenJDK, what we're doing is saying, okay, we will follow long-term support. So currently we have a Zing version of JDK 8, we have a Zing version of JDK 11, and we will have a Zing version of JDK 17. Um, okay, uh, I take the class count was a red herring as a stand-in for all the startup lot times and resource requirements. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I put that question in there because I came across some information that I was looking at for um, microservice architectures. And there was a bit of a discussion about, you know, what number of classes should be in a microservice. And I thought it would be interesting to ask the audience because clearly you're people who are developing these types of things, just to see what people thought in terms of whether there should be a number that you use as a limit on the um, the number of classes you have in a, a microservice or whether it's more about the functionality that that microservice delivers versus the size of it. So I think that's why I, I put that in there. Um, okay, so we're just coming up to the top of the hour and I'm not seeing any more questions. So I'll just reiterate what we said at the beginning, which is that everybody who was on the webinar will receive a copy of the slides and you will receive a link to the uh, recording of the webinar. And with that, I will say thank you very much for listening.